Hey, y'all. I'm going to throw my y'all in Texas. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for having us today at Brand Innovators. Um, I've been sitting here listening to the content, and we're hearing about a lot of amazing innovations in the space, um, which creates a ton of opportunities, but also um, can make prioritization probably pretty difficult for marketers. Um, and then also, uh, marketing is no longer the silo that it once was, uh, and these innovations are bleeding into other functional areas. And so today, we're going to talk a little bit about um, leadership and the role of leadership in driving agility and focus um, in consistent change. So, my name is Megan Sturgis. Um, I'm a sales leader at Google, and uh, we're always focused on how data, insights, and media can help our clients' business, but ultimately we talk a lot about digital transformation. Kevin is the uh, SVP of um, Consumer Beauty at Cody and a partner of mine. Kevin has been in CPG basically his entire career, starting at P&G, Revlon, L'Oreal, um, and now at Cody. And uh, he's constantly thinking about um, leadership and how he can make sure that he keeps his team focused on track and delivering results. Uh, he also is um, multilingual, so if you know Spanish, just test that out. He tells me, but I don't know that for sure. So I don't know the, what's it's true. Spanish and what else? French. Okay, anybody that speaks French, let's just make sure that this is true. Um, all right, so I thought it would be fun just to get to know Kevin, and then we'll talk business. So I'm going to do rapid fire questions. Kevin, what was your last impulse buy? A travel ring light for my laptop. So when I have my Zoom calls with the team back home, I can look ready here. On point. Uh, what was your last Google search? The time change between Paris and New York on a certain date, because we're a couple of weeks off of when we change our clocks versus theirs, so we're okay. sometimes five, sometimes six hours. Going to Paris, got a, a trip to Paris coming up. Well, I wish, but it's, it's more like a team's call. Okay. That's why uh, I had to coordinate. If I were there, I wouldn't have to worry about it. <laughs> what never fails to make you laugh? Dad jokes. Dad jokes? Love it. <laughs> I won't ask you for one. Um, and then for beauty, because you're in the beauty category, what's the most surprising beauty fact? Um, for me, the most surprising beauty fact is how a lot of the common chassis can kind of do the same thing. So mm -hmm. the example is when I used to work on Pantene, I remember seeing one of my R&D people take a, a big swipe of our deep conditioner and just rub it in her hands. And I was like... Wait, Moisturizer. I, thought this, I thought this was a rinse off product. I thought this was for hair. And it kind of kind of blew my world, but it's a, it's a great skin moisturizer. Hot tip. Too. Love that. Um, timeless nail shade. Uh, Slater Girl, which is uh, Sally Hansen Miracle Gel. Okay. It's a, it's a dark slate, as the name suggests. Love that. And then beauty product you can't live without. Mm, I would say, I mean, that that's... That's definitely one of them. Sally Hansen. Um, yeah, but I would say, um, you know, I'm so, I try so many products, but definitely moisturizer. I never, I never have a day without moisturizer. All right. It's good to keep that skin hydrated. All right. Um, so let's talk leadership in times of constant change and transformation. And let's talk about what, um, the way that you think about it. So Adam Grant, you guys probably know, is an organizational psychologist. And he says that no matter how high you climb in your career, you cannot succeed alone. The higher you climb, the more your success depends on the ability to make other people successful. So what's the single greatest indicator of a leader's ability to make others successful? It's a great question, and it's always hard to, to boil down to one thing. Um, but for me, the most important metric that I look at is retention, um, especially retention if you're direct reports, um, which is something that, that I'm very proud of. Uh, just as a, as a fun stat, I have not lost any of my direct reports in, uh, since August of 2020. So, um, that's awesome. Yeah. So I'm very proud of that. And, you know, uh, even in the New York beauty industry, which is very competitive in the times of quiet quitting, um, luckily no one has, no one of my direct reports has quit me. So that to me is my most important metric. That's amazing. Um, how do you feel like with, with your retention rate being so high, how are you able to keep folks so engaged and on your team? What do you think that 
what, what drives their loyalty to you? Another great question. They, they can probably best answer that question. <laughs> but but if, I, if, if I had to attribute it, I, 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 um, I maintain flexibility in my leadership style. I have certain occasions where I very much lead from the front and really am a, a pace setter in terms of how I uh, present ideas and think about things and create an expectation for people to um, to be creative, to bring solutions, and to move forward. But I also lead from the back at other times, meaning that I expect my brand leads to have a high degree of ownership in knowing their business and understanding what we have to deliver, our KPIs, whether they're internal and, and financial, external in terms of market share and winning with a consumer. But it's, but it's really knowing when to switch between the two because um, I think any leader who's, who's stagnant and doesn't have that flexibility will ultimately not have long-term success. Okay, so I don't know if you guys have ever seen Jimmy Kimmel. He does a segment called Mean Tweets. Um, and he has people come in and read the most awful things that are said about them um, in social media. So we're going to do... We're going to do that. Um, the point of this, though, is you need to be secure in your strengths to acknowledge your weaknesses. So, Kevin, putting you on the spot here on stage, what's the meanest thing or, or the most, the toughest piece of feedback you've received um, in a work setting? I'm going to give the one that's more recurring because probably that for me makes it the most tough, which means I'm not making the progress that I would like against it. Um, but it's to, to remain engaged even through um, tough conversations or, or really kind of working through things. And it's something that, um, as others have described it to me, I, I always have a voice in the room. So if I become disengaged in a conversation or disengaged in an important discussion, the, the, the silence can be deafening. Um, so if you, again, are leading from the front or you are someone who's, who's out there uh, defending your team and your business and you, and you pull back, it's, it's noticed. And so it's something that I've been working on to really have um, that consistency in, 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 in contribution and consistency in approach, even if uh, things feel like they might have gone sideways. How are you working on it? How are you trying to make that progress? And how do you know that you're doing it? I try to stay away from my phones during meetings. So Phones. Phones, yeah. Um, you know, less, less kind of distracted texting or nervous texting. Um, so that way that heads up, there's more eye contact. That's probably the biggest one. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so... We're talking a lot about innovation and the beauty category innovation basically drives that category um, like, like many others. It's not specific to beauty, but it's basically the cost of doing business. Um, I think that often organizations, uh, they liken innovation to the shiniest new object or the next new uh, technology that needs to be you know, tried and that in some ways that is right, but uh, if innovation is core to driving your business, how are you keeping your team focused on uh, top priorities to drive the business while still keeping them agile and open to trying new things, learning, uh, and moving forward? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's always a, a ensuring that we have a sense of balance. And the, the most important thing is always to keep in mind the business facts, even in beauty where it's, uh, it may seem like a category that is driven by innovation. The actual fact is that 90% of our business and any business in, in cosmetics, for example, is actually your, your base SKUs. And so where I encourage my team is to certainly think new about innovation, think about how we can bring an incremental consumer. Um, you know, we have 1,200 SKUs just on CoverGirl alone. So when we have innovation, it has to work really hard at bringing someone new to the fixtures, someone new to our product line and excited about the brand. So w what I try to remind everyone is that there's, there's a place for the, the tried and true and driving that base business of, of existing favorites, existing cult classics within the line, but also driving that spark to bring someone either back to CoverGirl who hasn't thought about the brand in a while or someone new to the brand who, who hasn't considered the brand before. So that's product innovation, but what about other types of innovation that could take place? So just thinking about all the different changes in the marketplace, rise of retail media, 
you know, new um, ways to use data, new ways to collect data. How are you thinking about uh, innovation and keeping your team focused from more of the um, media side of marketing? Yeah, great question. Yeah, from a media perspective, it's it's. I was just having this conversation with them the other day, and I won't name any like specific partners, but generally speaking, making sure that we're really thinking about each of the products that are coming out in our innovation pipeline and um, having that very specific and constructive dialogue with our media partners about the specific product. So, for example, knowing that foundation, the ladies probably can agree with me, or anyone who wears foundation, shouldn't say ladies, um, is that foundation is the most loyal category in cosmetics. And so when you're launching a new foundation or reformulating foundation or restaging a foundation, it's important to think about reaching consumers where they're engaged and where they can get enough information to decide, am I going to like the new formula, if, again, if it's a restage, or am I going to like something that's launching, understanding the type of coverage and longevity, and, and what are those touch points where consumers are more involved from a media perspective versus something like a lip gloss, which is pretty simple, more universal in terms of the shades, pretty self-explanatory, less risk. We were talking about foundation matching earlier. I think you got a little experience with that. I forgot my makeup bag at home, and so I had to go to CVS, and I bought all new CoverGirl. Only Everything. CoverGirl. Uh, Only yeah, CoverGirl. It's the first time I've ever had to do that. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, we were talking even about foundation and, and matching liquids versus powders and how... Um, they, because of the, the different formulations, we don't always have an exact match between a powder and a liquid. And so, um, again, there's a lot of things within foundation alone in terms of matching and finish and longevity of the finish that are important. And thinking about, again, from a media standpoint, where do you want to engage consumers when they're ready to kind of engage more than just that top level? Because it's, it's a segment that requires a little more thought to get it right. Do you want to talk a little bit about... Um your lip product, so we've been talking about some success you've been having in launching a new innovation, um, Yummy Lip. Yeah. And uh, you talked to it a, at an earlier event that we were at about uh, the combination of, you know, planning and luck and, um, and understanding when you've just hit the market at the right time. What, what is the process that you go through once you understand that an innovation is actually going to become part of you know, a, a core driver of your business or your year or your quarter, and um, and how do you then reprioritize for your team to, you know, to get behind something when you see that it's starting to hit? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, for those of you who work in, in consumer goods or in beauty, you know that the, the retailer timelines are planned out pretty far, and so a lot of times the, the reactivity comes down to media, and, and, and social is really probably the fastest place that you can react and, and create additional content and build a dialogue with consumers. Um, we are seeing a lot of early success with our, our CoverGirl Clean Fresh Yummy Gloss, so if you haven't tried it, I, I highly recommend it. Um, we've already seen what consumers are saying about it. We, it's being compared to, a, a, I won't say the brand, but a, a $30 lip oil from, from the prestige market. And so consumers are saying that this is a, a, an affordable dupe that gives a really similar and exciting um, effect. So, so for me, it's about coming back to the team and thinking, do we have enough conversation that we're building behind this? And since a lot of the early feedback that we saw from influencers and, and social was actually before we had started a lot of our own outreach efforts, it was challenging the team to say, okay, what are, the, what are they already talking about and do we want to already start bringing in some of that feedback into the conversation when we do our mailers and our outreach to influencers. How are you getting, like, how are you getting um, the read from the market early so that you could potentially influence your communication strategy? Um, is it about, you know, maybe influencers that you're working with that are providing that feedback? Or can you talk a little bit about how that works? Sure. I mean, our feedback loop is really two things. One is the actual consumption. So the sales of the product are significantly above our forecast for this period. So that's that's the unequivocal read on how the product is doing because regardless of what influencers are saying, that means that you know, the, every person is finding something interesting and a reason to pick up and use this product. And then secondarily, 
we really use uh, social listening and our and you know what influencers are saying about the product to understand the why because we can have our own hypotheses and we can see the the consumption numbers but it's it's going into okay what are people saying on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube about this product and then that that's really what gives us the the qualitative understanding of what people love. Okay, this is this is a, a deep dive question, so um, you might not want to share too much. But talking about prioritization, you had a product that outperformed your plan, and maybe you didn't plan to resource it the same amount, um, invest behind it as much. How are you? How do you reorient the team around a winner like that that's working and make those hard calls um, to help you understand, all right, if you need more resource, where is it going to come from? And how do you do that agilely? Well, I think every company handles it differently. And to your point, it's... Reveal only what you feel comfortable with. Yeah, I mean, I would say for us, we're, we're, we're a mid-sized beauty company. We have big brands, but we don't have... You know, we're not as big as a lot of our competitors are. And so we are able to, we're, we, we make the ask. I mean, we make the tough ask, which is put together a, a business case of what incremental money you're asking for, what are the incremental ideas that it would fund, what's your incremental ROI that you anticipate. And, and you know, that's an example to me of, of then leading from the back. You know, my, my CoverGirl team is the closest to the business. The lip team specifically is going to be closest to the lip category, the lip gloss subsegment, what's going on there. And they're going to have the best ideas on how we can drive that business even harder. So then, you know, they put together the, the, the business case and it goes from basically from me to our CFO and our executive team for, for review of whether you know, whether it's a compelling argument, um, whether the dollars are available, depending on what's going on at the rest of the company. And that's, that's our process. But I, again, I think that every company is different. We're just lucky to be um, agile enough that we can, we can work like that. And, and it, I think it keeps people very invested because they see that when they have an idea, um, that there are times that, that the money will come and we can, we can put things from, you know, from fast to even faster and, and to overdrive. Also, it sounds like you trust your team to make those calls and to have their finger on the pulse of the market, which then, you know, makes them feel good um, when they are able to get that win, which is great. So let's let's talk a little bit about um, a growth mindset. And a growth mindset is um, when you choose to believe that talent and ability can grow versus a fixed mindset when you just, you know, either you're good or you're not. Um, and so it leaders can really cultivate a growth mindset if they believe in it as well. Um, so what are some things that you do on your team to help people lean in, grow, and develop? And how, how are you specifically uh, enabling that growth? Great question. That's one where I personally tend to lead more from the front. I think that um, what I've noticed over the years is people tend to be inspired by some of the things that I geek out on and, and spend time on or get interested in, whether they're directly about our business or indirectly about our business. So, um, for example, uh, on the flight, I was on a long you know, cross-country flight earlier this week, and um, I just decided to go. I, I'm always following uh, makeup addiction and, and skincare addiction and the key forums on Reddit, but uh, decided to dig a little deeper and just kind of see what they were saying about CoverGirl. And so I found a really fascinating thread about kind of where the brand is, and it had 60 odd comments um, that I thought were really balanced and spot on. So, so I sent it to the team, and I was just like, when you have time, read through this. It's interesting. There's, there's a lot of feedback here that is free and is a gift and we should be thinking about for ourselves. Um, but also, it's about leading from the front to encourage people to um, have a life outside of work and to have passions because I think that um, that's so important to being creative, to having a, a, a clear mind about oneself. So... Um, one that I share sometimes is that I, I kind of went down a, a crypto rabbit hole about a year ago. Okay. Um, and to make a long story short, uh, I did make a few hundred percent return, not, not thousands of percent, but a few hundred percent. Uh, and I did pull enough out that I, that I still came out on top even after the crypto crash. So mm. point is, well I didn't know anything about crypto three years <laughs> ago. 
now I know a little something. And so I, I like to share those examples of, of to, to keep people inspired and just um, know that if there's something you're interested in, you can develop a, a certain amount of knowledge and expertise. Excellent. Um, I, d I work a lot in CPG, as you know, and uh, a lot of what the conversations that I'm having right now are about culture change, just overall, um, all the processes are changing and the way that you go to market has changed a lot. Um, it's important, I think, I think one of the hardest things to really um, evolve is how to drive innovation and how to take on more of a, um, an experimentation mindset, which test and learn is what a lot of people say, but um, there's a lot to experimentation. There's a, um, a tolerance of risk, there's trust, um, there's a clarity in KPIs and a deep understanding of measurement to understand should you move forward or, or not. So how are you enabling that culture of experimentation on your team? The most important thing for, for me, uh, given our culture at Cody, which is largely a consensus culture, is to really first have a read of what your own company's culture is and, and how your team fits it with that. Because even if you're creating something special for your team, you should be making sure that it lives within the broader culture of your organization. And so um, I could say a lot of things, but I think the most important thing, the way that I de-risk taking risks and de-risk um, any hesitation is to, if we are looking at an idea, whether it's someone on the team has come with or I, an idea that I have because maybe I've been here at South By or, or have heard about something that I think could be interesting, is to really shop the idea around to all of the key stakeholders and thinking about not just who in the US office in New York, but also maybe who from our global team in Paris could be an important stakeholder on a new idea or a new way of doing things. And so, um, like I said, it's really leaning into the consensus culture and making sure that if we want to do something, at least 10 people on three different teams on two different continents have heard about it and are all nodding their heads to agree that this is something that's interesting, this is something that's new, this is something we have not done before, and it's something we want to try. And then it doesn't become, even if it's something that doesn't work out, it doesn't become, oh, is this one person's idea or this one team that went rogue. It's really more of a collective effort, and it, and it creates safety for people to be able to, to then say, okay, I want to spend a month or two kind of shopping around this idea and, and keeps that constant flow of new ideas coming. That's great. Uh, and you talked a little bit about safety. Um, so Google did some research, and this isn't new. This has been around for like five years, I think, or maybe more. Um, and they wanted to understand what are the conditions that create the most effective teams. And you know, Google does it in a very scientific way and creates like a whole experiment. And the, the net result is that the number one driver of team success is psychological safety on the team which is this feeling that, uh, that your ideas um, are valuable, that you have trust, and um, that you feel comfortable and safe in expressing those ideas without any kind of retribution or, you know, maybe a sense of failure if, if you're not able to deliver. So um, I know that in beauty, uh, the, the, everyone's seen Devil Wears Prada, you know, luxury beauty, like there's a little bit of a, of a tough culture sometimes. So in your team, and I, and I know this to be true, how do you create that carve out to enable psychological safety? And I would imagine it has a lot to do with the retention you've, able, you've been able to, um, to maintain over these really challenging years. Where I really start is, is my mindset and what my job to be done is. And, and every day when I come into work physically or virtually as, as it happens nowadays from time to time. When I come in, I'm very clear that my job is to bring out the best in everyone. And whether that's my direct reports, my cross-functional teams, people above me, people below me, um, everyone. And so when you come with a mindset that your job is to bring out the best in people, then it allows you to hear things with a very open mind. and. Um, 
it, it, like any feedback being a gift, so are ideas. And even though you know it's understanding that ideas or brainstorms can they come in fragments, they come in snippets. They, it's it's not a linear process. So for me, when I listen to ideas from my team, one, I actively solicit ideas from the newest and most junior members because they're the closest to the consumer experience. They're the closest to what's happening out there in a fiercely competitive world and making sure that I'm proactively inviting feedback, but also I also call on people because if you're quiet, that's fine, but you're not there to be quiet. You're there to bring your exciting, constructive, critical feedback. Um, and then I'm always listening because even if it's not an idea that we can implement now, maybe it's an idea that we can implement later. Maybe it's not an idea for one specific uh, category, but maybe it's something that could work interestingly in another category that we are playing in as an organization. And so, um, like I said, that openness and really coming with the mindset that you're there to bring out the best of everyone at, at all times as a leader. Okay. And then last question, and then we'll take questions. That um, So beauty as a category has evolved significantly just in, in, its, in the definition of beauty, driven by a lot of the um, organizations like yourselves. Uh, it's more inclusive, it's more diverse, even, you know, foundation can be worn by anyone and uh, nail shades can be w worn by anybody. So can you talk a little bit about Cody's role in connecting with your consumers authentically with purpose and that new definition of beauty and how you see it? Yeah, absolutely. There's 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 a couple of ways. One is we we have our corporate purpose, vision, and values, with which inclusivity and diversity is a key pillar. Uh, some of you may have seen that recently. Cody actually started a, a petition to change some of the articulations of beauty in the official Oxford Dictionary, which tend to be uh, very binary in terms of being female-focused and um, and when you read them, actually quite surprising that they they are still used as, as examples to articulate what beauty is in 2023. So that's really um, one of our core reasons to exist as a company um, and that brings all of our brands together under a common purpose. When I think about the, the specific brands that I lead, um, it's about making sure that we have relationships that go across so many different groups so that people can see themselves within our brand. And it's also, when I say going across different groups, it's also across time. So for example, it's not just talking about pride during June, but it's also talking about Spirit Day in October and the important work that our uh, cause marketing partner, GLAD, does around anti-bullying and raising awareness of suicide and anti-bullying of LGBT youth and supporting them during that time. It's about having um, faces of our brand, um, cover girls, for example, that can represent the diversity of um, not just ethnicity, but also age, uh, different beauty looks um, across the diverse market that we serve and making sure that they're also informing um, our strategies and that we're hearing their feedback. And so, um, you know, from, from kind of the corporate level down to the brand level, down to even the, the cause marketing partners that we, we um, are involved with, it's so important. And, and like I said, not just showing up for Black History Month in February, not just showing up for Pride Month in June, but having an ongoing inclusive approach to, to our relationship with consumers, influencers, and, and on any of the platforms that we are. Great. Thank you so much. I mean, the themes of trust, authenticity um, resonated through basically everything that you said uh, as, a, as a guiding light to steer you through these just crazy amounts of change. Um, so thank you so much. Any questions here from the audience? Anybody? Hi, uh, Ken from Iterable. You were talking about getting cross-departmental buy-in, and I used to lead cross-departmental teams. I haven't since the pandemic. I'm kind of curious, tactically, what is that? Is that Slack? Is that surveys? Like, how are you getting people in 20 different countries to agree without coming in and sitting around a table and kind of slapping hands and walking out? Well, I'm, the, the most important is to 
work how they work. So some teams like Microsoft Teams, some teams like email, some teams like to call, some people, like, it really depends. So, I mean, I, I, I mean, I try to treat everyone how they want to be treated and not make assumptions. So I kind of look at how, how they communicate and I encourage my team, if you, if you want to get on someone's calendar, like how do they normally approach you and, and, and then you should approach that team that way because um, it probably means that's how they're most comfortable. And so to avoid any sort of communication or time change or all the other barriers that could exist, um, usually the best way is to approach them how they approach us. And so that's kind of the short, shortcut answer. Yeah. Yeah, Jody. Hi, uh, Jody Tsark from Scripps. Uh, you mentioned that you know there was um, on social media that one of your products was promoted as a great dupe to a premium product, and I guess my question is, is that okay for you, or do you guys try to change the message? that just because something is more expensive doesn't make it the better and that you have to be the copy or the dupe of that, but that on your own, you're just as, you're, the quality is just as good and just try to change that message. That's a great question. I will say first, um, for those of you who are not beauty junkies, dupes are an incredibly important and big phenomenon in beauty. and. There are some beauty brands that I would say are almost built exclusively on a dupe strategy. So for iconic classic brands like CoverGirl, Sally Hansen, Rimmel London, we certainly have things that make us unique and distinctive so we don't rely on dupes in and of themselves as a strategy. That all being said, it is important and we are very appreciative when influencers or consumers recognize that the products we offer, uh, because they're such an accessible price point, because you can buy CoverGirl at CVS, you can buy Sally Hansen at CVS, um, we, we very much appreciate and are, are flattered by the comparison because, you know, it, it, it's, whether it's fashion or beauty, I mean, why wouldn't you want to look like a million dollars? But knowing that not every consumer can afford that million dollar. What's the what's the ten dollar version? Um, we find it's just a very helpful way to bring in um, consumers who otherwise wouldn't think about our product or wouldn't know about our product, and are you know even within ten dollars and less within you know the drugstore price points. There's a lot of options, so it's just a way to to kind of uh, continue to highlight our products that we're again we we welcome. We're very happy when when consumers make the comparison. I'm a big fan of Dukes, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rob. Rob. <laughs> Thanks, Joey. All right, anybody else? Yeah, great. Hi, I'm Audrey from Indeed. Um, I just had a question about how you said there you have cover girls. Do you... Could you just... Uh, sorry, could you speak up just a little bit? It's pretty Oh, loud. I'm sorry. Um, do you have people that are different genders that are cover girls or because I noticed you didn't mention that would you consider other genders cover girls or are you expanding that definition yeah so <laughs> yeah so I, there's a couple of different answers so one um Currently, our CoverGirl slate is all cis female CoverGirls. It hasn't always been the case because as CoverGirl, historically, if you look over time, we've had a very diverse slate and we did have a cover boy. Um, it was before Cody owned the brand. So we have had cis men as cover girls in the past. Um, but the second way that I wanted to it, it, it answer is that the US and our consumer base is so diverse that at any given time, we only have three or four actual cover girls that are signed, which is impossible to represent all of the different ethnicities, gender expressions, etc. And so what we do is really work with our influencer slate to round out, right? Because you have kind of your three, four official cover girls, and then we have you know, 40, 50, 60 influencers that we, you know, kind of in that micro, macro tier that we keep relationships with at any given time. And that's where you see 
everything we can think of represented. So you see trans people, you see um, mixed ethnicities, you have uh, influencers that we work with a lot who are primarily Spanish speaking and serve a, a Spanish first Hispanic consumer. Um, again, ones that are cis men who are who are makeup artists because that's a very a significant part of, of the makeup influencer scene. So um, again, it's really the, the combination of who are the actual you know, two, three, four cover girls, but then who's the slate of, of, of other voices that in social and in our content are, are um, showing how they use the product and how they use the brand. Great. Well, so many great insights from, from Kevin on this panel. I know we have a, a bunch of great takeaways here. So Megan, Kevin, thank you so much. Appreciate it.